I just had you all sit down so you, and stand back up in a little exercise this morning. Keep you all engaged. I'll just stick that in my pocket. So this morning, um, I put the last period on this at 1135 last night. So we'll see what, what it turned out to. Worked on it all week. I thought it was clear, but then I get to the end and I was like, man, it does not really come together. So anyhow, um, I have entitled, if you look in there, I had Pam, she didn't know what to write, so if it says thankful, she did not make a mistake, I changed the title. So um, she did the right thing. So it's called this morning, An Attitude of Gratitude. Uh, as we're coming up on Thanksgiving, I thought that it would be a good time to approach that a little bit and, and see how that should fit in our lives um, as believers. Growing up, do what? Oh, Children's Church. Okay. I forgot. I had a couple things on my mind this morning. We'll dismiss for Children's Church right now. But Brenda, that doesn't include you. You can't leave. <laughs> Sorry about that. All right. I just forgot. <clears throat> but it, we're talking about children, so I'll go back childhood. Um, I don't know about y'all, but there were two words I was taught that were very important growing up. One was please, and the other was thank you. All right? These were not optional. So if I went to someone's house and they offered me something, I could either say, I didn't go, yeah, sure, no, no, no. It was either yes, please, or yes, thank you. And if I didn't want it, it wasn't, nah, I don't need that. They, uh, it was like, no, thank you. Um, if I did not use those words, and I wasn't grateful when somebody brought me something and I didn't say thank you, I would get one chance. And my dad or my mom and usually would say, uh, what do you say? And I can tell you most of the time I got it right. Because if I had not gotten it right, and I would have gone, I don't know, what did I say? Um, what would have happened? Any of y'all ever seen the movie Tombstone? <laughs> okay, you remember Doc Holliday? And he said, what we have here is a failure to communicate. <laughs> well, I will guarantee you that if I had not have done what said what I was supposed to, my dad would have communicated, okay? So thank you became a very important thing in gratitude. Now my parents grew up in the depression, both of them did, and it was a tough time and they both shared with me things uh, that, were, that were rough. My dad told me he remembered things being tough enough. They lived on a farm, but he said, I can remember going to bed and our dinner that night was a bowl of wilted lettuce, okay? It was a tough time. That's not very much food. Have you all ever ate wilted lettuce? Number one, I don't really care too much for it. Number one, but if I was hungry, I'd eat it. But number two, it's really not what I'd call filling. Okay? My mom, she at around 13, I think it was, she, they had quite a few people in their family, which the families were usually pretty big in that time, a lot of the people in the area. My mom went to work for another family, a wealthy family, and she cleaned their house, did their dishes, and did all that stuff. And in return, she got room, board, uh, clothing and whatever she needed to go to school so she could finish school. So she did not live at home at 13 years old. So she worked her way through that. I mean, she saw her family. It wasn't like it was the other side of the world. But the point was, it wasn't easy. And so my mom and my dad, as they became more successful and, and had some things, they were very thankful. They were very grateful that God had provided them ways to live better. And they were intent on making sure that my sister and I had a lot better an easier go of it than what they did. And I remember my mom had a saying, every time something would happen, uh, and that somebody would be talking about not having this or that, she'd say, well, and this is some old saying, I don't know where it came from, but she would say it, I was sad because I had no shoes, and then I saw a man who had no feet. And she would say that to me, it stuck in my head, because I heard it for years and years, this attitude of gratitude. If you want to turn with me to Luke 17, if you got your Bible there, we're going to look at Luke 17 this morning. And we're going to look a little bit about what gratitude looks like. Luke 17, I'll give you just a second to find it. We're going to start in verse 11. It's not a real long passage, but man, is it packed with some information. Luke 17, starting with verse 11. I'm reading out of the NASB, so it may look a little different than yours, but... 
We'll start here. Verse 11. And it came about while he, talking about Jesus, was on the way to Jerusalem that he was passing between Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered a certain village, ten leprous men who stood at a distance met him. They raised their voices saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said to them, Go, show yourselves to the priests. And it came about as they were going, they were cleansed. Now one of them, when he saw that he had been healed, turned back, glorifying God with a loud voice. And he fell on his face at Jesus' feet, or his feet, giving thanks to him. And he was a Samaritan. And Jesus answered and said, Were there not ten cleansed? But the nine, where are they? Was no one found who turned back to give glory to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, Rise and go your way. Your faith has made you well. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for your word. There is power in your word, Lord. There are things, if we follow your word, Lord, that contain so many blessings, not only for us, but ways that we can be blessings to others. And so, Lord, may we take your word and let it come to life in us as you teach us through the Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus, amen. So what we have here is this leprosy. Now, I don't know if you all are familiar. Christians discuss and, and kind of discuss or whatever over some of the weirdest things. I'm reading about leprosy, and they can't even come to a consensus what biblical leprosy really was. Okay, You got one group who says, well, it was a former version of this Hansen's disease, which we have now, that's, that they can treat with antibiotics. And you got other people saying it was something else. And you know what? The bottom line is it doesn't really matter. Because the fact is that in the Bible times, this disease was a disease that caused their bodies really to just eat up, be eaten up. Okay, fingers fall off, feet can fall off. It was a horrible disease, uh, whatever it, however it started, whatever it was. And it was interesting because in Levitical law, this is what it says. This is in Leviticus 13. Uh, Y'all can write that down and we won't go there. But 13, 45 through 46, it says, The leprous person who has the disease shall wear torn clothes, let the hair of their head hang loose, and he shall cover his upper lip and cry out, unclean, unclean. He shall remain unclean as long as he has the disease. He shall live alone. His dwelling shall be outside of the camp. So if you came down with leprosy in this age, that was a pretty bad deal. You couldn't associate with anybody. Nobody was going to come up and give you hugs. Nobody was going to be shaking your hand. They're going to stay away from you. And you had to holler out unclean as people were coming so they knew you had leprosy. So even though you're covered up, it doesn't matter. You had to brand yourself. Okay, so it was a horrible thing, and the worst, probably even worse, they're not even really sure. Some people say man, they believed it was contagious. I mean, I read a bunch of this, and it's just confusing. But the bottom line is, for the Jewish faith, it was incurable by man. You could not cure leprosy. You had no cure for it. And many, if not most, of the people of the Jewish faith believe God inflicted the curse of leprosy upon the people for sins that they committed, be it mentally or in action. So they were ceremonial unclean, and that was even worse for them than being physically unclean. And coming in contact with a person of leprosy was second in uh, a defilement, was only second in the list of them touching or coming in contact with a dead person. So it was almost like they were zombies, okay? I mean, in our modern day, if you wanted something to equate it to, what people view as a zombie, because they couldn't participate. In the Old Testament, there are three accounts in the whole of the Old Testament, anytime lepers, there's only three accounts of people who were healed. Most of the things you'll read will say two, but I will show you that there were three. The two that most people think about was Miriam, Moses' sister, when she's complaining to Aaron as if God couldn't hear, about um, Moses marrying this Cushite woman. She is not happy about it, so she's criticizing Moses. Boom, she gets struck down with leprosy. Moses prayed for her, and God says, okay, but she's going to deal with this for seven days, so out of the camp, lady. So she had it for seven days, and then she was restored and was healed, okay, by God, not by man. The other one is Naaman, who was the commander of the king of Syria. And depending on what translation you have, some call it Aram, but at any rate, 
he was this commander and he had leprosy and through the prophet Elisha he was told go bathe in this filthy river and you'll be healed and he obeyed and he did because that's what God told Elisha to tell him. Now that's the two most people think about but there's another one and it was Moses. When he's bargaining with God and saying they're not going to listen to me when you tell me go tell Pharaoh to let your people go and God says stick your hand in your cloak. So he sticks his hand in his cloak, pulls it out, boom, leprosy. Now that freaked me out a little bit. I don't know about y'all, but it freaked me out a little bit. So then God's okay, stick it back in there, boom, he sticks it back in, he pulls it out, he's healed. Those are the only three accounts in the whole of the Old Testament of people being healed of leprosy. There's other people who had it, but none others that were mentioned that were healed. So it was a really bad, di bad <coughs> um, disease. So let's look at, real quickly, this scripture, what was happening here. So obviously these lepers, we see, had a need, all right? So they, and we're going to look at them, and then we're going to apply this in a minute. But they had a need, and so they're, they see Jesus coming, and it says they lifted their voice, they, or they, you can, some translations I saw or some things said cried out, and they said master. Well, this word master, I'm not going to give you Greek lessons today, but there are a couple words we're going to look at what the full meaning of the word, because it really adds, it adds some richness to this text. Master, teacher, chief, or commander. In other words, when they saw him, if it, Luke using this word was saying they identified him as somebody in authority, somebody who had some power. And that's the important part. So they see Jesus coming, and they're screaming out, Master! Interestingly enough, they did not ask for healing. They said, depending on translation, have mercy on us or have pity on us. Okay? I guess maybe they thought, hey, it's obvious. We're lepers. It's a mess. You know? And so Jesus is looking at them. Another interesting thing about this, if you'll notice, it says, let me get to that scripture here real quick. Um, when he saw them, he said to them, and obviously heard them, go and show yourselves to the priests. Okay? He didn't say you were healed. He said, go show yourself to the priests. And get this, and it came about as they were going, they were cleansed. This is important. Okay, we're coming to Jesus. Is important because if they would have stood there and said, go show ourselves to priest. Now, as a kid, again, back to kids. I'm, I'm on the kid thing because I forgot the children's church. Um, anyway, going back to being a kid, I remember the first time I heard this story, I'm thinking to myself, okay, so they want to go show the priest as a testimony of what Jesus did. But that really is not what the point was. The point was for them to go back into society they had to go to the priest, show themselves clean, show themselves pure, and then the priest would allow them, okay, you guys are clean, you no longer have leprosy, you can go back in and be part of the community. You're no longer outcasts. So, that, so that's what they were supposed to be doing. Jesus says, go show yourself to the priest. Now, if they would have stood there and said, really? Um, I got leprosy, did you not see this? Okay, because, I mean, we got this stuff, we're not supposed to go see anybody, we can't even go into town. But they didn't. Jesus said go. They knew he was somebody in authority. They turned. They went. As they were going, they were cleansed. And we're going to look at that word here in just, just a minute. So they were cleansed. This is a side note, but I want us to realize this. Bartimaeus, the blind beggar, okay, he was on the side of the road yelling out to Jesus. Same kind of thing because he wanted to see. Jesus finally, he gets Jesus' attention, even though they, the people were trying to shut him up. He says, bring him over here. When Bartimaeus comes up, it was just as obvious that this guy was blind. Okay? Because he's like being led along by people, right? He can't see. Okay? So Jesus is there, but he knew it was Jesus. He heard the crowds and everything. And Jesus, in this case, didn't do the same thing. He said, what do you want me to do for you? I'd be like, dude, I'm blind. <laughs> kind of want to see here. So Bartimaeus says, I'm blind, I'd like to see, and Jesus says, okay. So Jesus heals him, but he asked him what he wanted first. So these are two completely different ways that Jesus reacted. What's my point here for us as a side note? Don't expect Jesus, when you go to God and you ask him something, do not expect him to do something and answer you exactly the way he answered somebody else in the same situation. Okay? 
So we got to be open to God doing whatever it is he says that he wants to do. Because he kind of does what he wants, when he wants, the way he wants. <laughs> kind of learned that over the years. <laughs> okay, so they moved in faith. And when they moved in faith, obeying what he said, they received their answer. Then what do we see? We got ten guys. All of a sudden, they're like, whoa, dude, I'm healed. I don't have this stuff anymore. So ripping off these clothes, these torn clothes, and they're thinking, man, life is good. So they're moving on, except for one. One guy says, man, I've been this way my life. I had no hope. I was hopeless. There was absolutely nothing I could do to fix this. And this guy just fixed this for me. He's something special. And I am so thankful, I'm going back to let him know. And he not only went back to tell him thank you, he fell in front of him, honoring him, a sign of worship, a sign of acceptance. And what we're going to look at, I think you're going to find this guy, who was a Samaritan, who for any historian, anybody who's familiar with the history, the Samaritans were hated by the Jews. Okay, they were... They were still kind of part of them, but they had followed idols and all kinds of stuff. There's a whole story. I'm not going to get into all that. But at any rate, just know that they were hated and considered foreigners, even though they were, like, right next door. All right? And this guy was a Samaritan. He goes back to Jesus, and he said, <laughs> you know, thank you. Interesting, how did Jesus respond? Were there not ten of you? And where's the other nine, basically? Where'd they go? Why are they not here? And you, a foreigner, have come back to give your thanks and to show your gratitude. And this is what Jesus said to him. And here's what we're going to look at. Your faith, in some says, has made you well. Some translations say has made you whole. And we're going to look at what that word is because it's a very, very important word of what happened. Verse 14, when the, the words we're going to look at, in verse 14, when they were leaving... There was a different word that Luke used. I have to kind of think that Luke was pretty smart. He was a doctor, okay? And I have to believe, reading the gospel, that he had a pretty good command of the language. I think we could all agree that, right? Educated guy, knew what words to use to communicate. So there's two different words used here. First one on, he says, as they were going, they were cleansed, all right? This word cleansed actually means to make pure or to clean, and it means removing the intermingling of filth. Now we can look at that as a physical thing, which it was, but it also kind of had a ceremonial connotation with the Jews because ceremonial clean and pure was very important to them. That's why they're living outside the camp. Nobody can touch them, nobody can be around them. So they were cleansed of this disease in the natural and they would have been considered pure for the ceremonies of the Jewish people, okay? An interesting thing, though, when the other guy goes back, Luke uses a whole different word for what Jesus said. Your faith has made you well. It actually comes or made you whole or it actually could be interpreted, your faith has saved you. Because the word comes from the root word of sozo, which is a, a word, and, and I'm going to prove this here so you guys don't think I'm just making this stuff up. Um, the same word, to save in a biblical sense, this is one of the ways. First of all, universally it can be made, made meant to mean suffering from a disease being made, delivered from that to make well heal or restore to health. But it also is used to save in the technical biblical sense, saying to deliver from the penalties of the messianic judgment. Okay, messianic judgment, that's the word that Strong's uses, but essentially God's judgment, it removes us from the penalty of sin. Okay? That same word is used, sozo, or a root word from the same word, in Matthew 121, when it says the prophecy of Jesus, she will give birth to a son, and you should call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Okay? I did a lot of study on this because I'm looking at that, and I'm thinking, man, that's pretty amazing. Here's a Samaritan. Jesus didn't preach to him. I don't know, maybe he heard him preach someplace or heard about him or whatever. I don't know. I don't know what the story was. But here's this guy who's realizing something very important. And God, I believe, the, has revealed it to him of who this Jesus was. You guys have no idea who this guy was, probably, because I didn't know who he was. But he had a quote that I want to share with you. A guy named Warren Wiersbe, I think is how you pronounce it. He was a Baptist pastor, conference speaker, and he wrote a whole bunch of books. 
Um, in one of his books, Be Courageous, this is what he wrote. The Samaritan's nine friends had been declared clean by the priest, but he, the Samaritan guy, was declared saved by the Son of God. Man, that's a powerful statement. I read that and I thought, wow, which one would I want? Yeah. Okay? See, because it really doesn't matter today. It doesn't matter if, if you come up to anybody in any position of authority in our church, what they think. At the end of the day, the only thing that really matters is what God thinks and where your relationship is with God. Man, that's a powerful statement. <clears throat> so how does this, how do we apply this practically to our lives? Well, number one, the lepers had a need. So we have to ask ourselves, what's our need? What's my need? And everybody has different needs. And I can tell you today that probably every one of us has something that's kind of out of our control that we could really use God to intervene in. Okay? Maybe it is, uh, first of all, and on, I don't know who's watching online too, so I, I, I want to make sure that we know that you've got to have Jesus first. If you don't have Jesus as your Savior, and you've never made a commitment to Him, and you're not following Him, man, that's the first need. Because without it, it's a losing battle. Okay? It's hopeless. But with Jesus, there's hope. That's the first thing. But if He is your Savior, and we've, it, you've made Him Savior and Lord of your life, that doesn't mean our life is smooth sailing. Man, that's a one of the worst, probably damaging things. This is a sidebar, I'm sorry. I'm, I don't need a milk crate. I'll stand on the floor. Um, one of the most damaging things I ever saw was during the 70s when I was growing up, and people were preaching, and yes, this is true, but it's not 100%. God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Is that true? It is. But you know what that means without some explanation to people? God loves you, and men, you accept him, and everything's going to be bright and wonderful and beautiful. And at the first sign of struggle, and I know people who did this, well, where's that wonderful, beautiful life that God promised me? And boom, they came in the front door, and they were out the back. We've got to understand, Jesus said, in this life you'll have troubles, and we've got to understand and accept that, okay? Just like these guys, we have needs and things that we can't fix. And maybe today it's financial, or maybe it's health, or the health of a family member. Maybe it's a family struggle or issue that needs to be dealt with. Maybe you just need some direction in something. Whatever our need is, the one thing we need is to develop a close relationship with the Lord. So we take this need, they lifted up their voices and hollered. It's amazing because all of them were hollering, oh, have mercy on us. But then they quietly went about their way. Really? They should have been hollering just like the other guy. When he ran back, it said he was crying out to the Lord again, Hey, man, thank you, thank you. They lifted up their voices. We need to look to the one in authority. And we need to cry out to him. And sometimes we're broken. And I'm going to tell you the most powerful times I've ever seen God move in my life is when I was broken before him. I was at a loss. I could do nothing. And it was like, God, you know what? I give. I can't, I can't do this. It's yours. And I have to let go of it. Which is, if I had done that in the first place, <sighs> man. But, you know, I like to help God out a little bit every once in a while. <laughs> yeah, ask me how that works out for me. Okay. <laughs> so we do that. And then we have, to, if God tells us, we have to begin to listen. He spoke to them immediately, okay? But he doesn't do that with us. Not always. Sometimes you'll get that leading and that, first of all, but you've got to listen to the Lord. However he speaks to you, and he speaks to all of us, again, differently. All right? But as he speaks, listen. Listen to him, and don't move until he tells you to. But when he tells you to move, even if you don't see it, then move. Because Hebrews 11, 1, remember? Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. In other words, it's the certainty of the things hoped for, whatever that is we're hoping for or trusting him for, but it's the proof. So you got proof in faith before you ever see the result or the manifestation of it. Okay? But that's because God said it. But if he doesn't say it, let me give you a warning. If God does not say it, do not put words in his mouth to try to manipulate him into doing what you want. Okay? Because I've done that, and I'm going to tell you what happened. Well, I'm not going to tell you what happened. You can imagine what happened. Disaster. 
Okay? We, don't, we can't lead God around on a chain. All right? We take it to Him, we leave it with Him, we listen to Him, and we follow Him. Scripture tells us to be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let our requests be made known to God. Here we are coming up on Thanksgiving. I know there are groups that want to cancel the day because they say it's not really what we've always been taught. I don't care about that. I wasn't there then. It doesn't make any difference. What I do is I'm happy we have a day set aside where we can think about being thankful. So if people have problems with that, I'm sorry, but that's the way I feel about it. Okay, this is, our day isn't about being whatever they're saying. Our day is about looking, saying, we're going to sit this side of the day and be thankful. And that's what we should do. There's power in gratitude. And we need to decide if we're going to lift up our voices. You know, when this guy went back, he worshipped Jesus. One of the things, the thank you and the gratitude, was worshipping Jesus. But now, the other guys, if they would have been yelling and screaming and done the same thing, and they would have all gone into town... And said, hey, guess what? We're going to tell you what this Jesus did. Now we've gone from not only worshiping Christ, we've gone to being a witness for him. That's what we should be. I know people who have received miracles from God. Miracles, answers, and then never, ever, ever share it with anybody. And they treat God like he's a water faucet. I need some water, boop, we'll turn him on. All right, thank pour out a blessing, boop, turn him off. All right? That is not scriptural. And Jesus, I believe, was hurt. Some say he was angry. I don't think he was angry. I think he was hurt. Where are the other ten? That's what I believe that happened. I don't believe he was angry. I believe he was hurt. And we don't, I mean, who wants to grieve the, the Lord after everything he's done for us? He had enough grief what he went through for us. We don't need to grieve him anymore. So today we have to ask ourselves. As we come up on this time of Thanksgiving, a time to reflect, which one of these people am I? I had to ask myself, which am I? Am I one of the nine, or am I one of the one, the one guy that went back? So we have to ask ourselves that, am I going to be grateful, or am I just going to take what God gives me and go on about it? Well, hopefully this morning as we take an account of everything that God's done, that we will be willing to be thankful, be willing to share with people what God's done in our lives. And I will guarantee you, that's why I chose all the songs I chose this morning. Count your blessings. It said conflict, great or small. Count your blessings, regardless of what's going on. I know it's an old song, but guess what? The message is awesome. Count your blessings. That's where we are, folks. All of us. Count our blessings. The other one, our God. He's great, powerful, mighty. He's the one in authority. He can do all that and give thanks with a grateful heart. Do we have a grateful heart this morning? That's our question, and that's, that's the question. Do we have an attitude of gratitude? So as we go through this week, and as we come up on this time, and we're sharing times, maybe sit down and make a list count those blessings. What do you have? What are some of the things that maybe you don't think about right off the top of your head? Health. I'm going to tell you, if you came in here this morning, and you were able to come in this building this morning, you are able to walk in here, we got something to be thankful for. Boom. Top of the list. I have a cousin. Um, we were down there yesterday, and I won't say her name, because, but she wouldn't care. She's trusting the Lord, man, but she's going through chemo, and, and it's, it's really rugged on her right now. She hadn't lost her faith in the Lord, but it's a tough time. But she was thankful yesterday she could spend the time with her family. She said, even if this is the last one, I'm thankful for today. Attitude of gratitude. And as uh, I think Jeremy's going to be here and somebody else up front and the praise team comes forward, let us take an account this morning of where we are. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you, Lord, that... Man, everything that you've done. And Lord, if we, even if everything else was a mess, the very fact that you died for our sins to give us eternal life, that in itself is enough to be thankful for. So Lord, may we not take for granted the things that you do for us. Let us not take for granted our families. Let us not take for granted our health. Let us not take for granted the provisions you do for us. 
But as Paul said, let us be content in our situations and thankful to you for all that you do. Let that be, let that be what we do. In Jesus' name, amen.